So thank you for inviting me uh, to present at this conference. Um, this is going to be a rather large shift in gears, um, although towards the end I will present some rather old um, stuff that we did uh, that actually has neurons in it, at least simulated ones. Um, but most of it is really going to be about behavior. So I think someone yesterday said that they feel a bit of an outlier in this conference. Wait until you hear my talk. Um, okay, so um, not only is it going to be computational, but it's going to be mostly about behavior. Uh, but the idea that um, that I had for this talk actually changed. So if, if you uh, if you notice, the title is uh, actually different from what's advertised in the program, and that's because listening to these talks um, over the past few days, which I've very much enjoyed, I decided that I should uh, try to combine two seemingly very different things that are nevertheless linked, at least in my mind, by a common computational principle, which I think is important, and which I would really like to understand more about the kind of the neural implementations of. And so, to a large part, this talk is a, is a call for help to, you know, um, think together about what, what might be the neural underpinnings of, uh, of, these, uh, of this computational principle, acknowledging, of course, that, you know, there is a diversity in systems, so different systems might have different ways of implementing the same principle. All right, so what, what am I talking about? What, what is this computational principle? Um, so the, the principle is that the normatively correct way of updating memories uh, depends on one's uncertainty about how relevant that memory is and also how relevant, how, um, what, what we know already about uh, the world from previous experience. Um, all that uncertainty should in, in some way shape the way we update our current uh, memories. And so um, the first example of this principle um, came up very, uh, very strongly in a recent uh, study that we did together with James Hild and Daniel Wolpert, uh, which in one way, um, at least my favorite way of summarizing uh, what this project was about, it, it was about what's in a learning curve. and. Um, and so everybody is familiar with this kind of plot. We have you know, it in all our introductory textbooks and, and, um, and uh, classes. Um, it's the classical learning curve. And it measures some measure of performance uh, as it improves over time in your favorite behavioral paradigm. And indeed, uh, during this conference, we have actually seen uh, a couple of examples of, of such learning curves. And so that's our standard way of characterizing how learning proceeds over time. And yet, when it comes to characterizing what we actually learn at the end, we would like to think that in many cases, the, the, the representations that we learn are rather rich and, and structurally complex. And so, such as you know, uh, taxonomic trees, cognitive maps, uh, you know, in, internal models for forward and, and inverse models for motor control. So those are richly structured representations. And yet, when it comes to describing how they develop over learning, we usually use this super simplistic scalar measure as a, as a function of time. So, in some sense, uh, what, what, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how do we bridge this gap? Can we characterize, at least in a, in a slightly more kind of richer way, what happens over the course of learning than just, than just a learning curve, if you think that the representations we develop are, are rich like these down here? So, this pro in this project, we kind of took the first baby step in this direction, where we considered at least one um, element of, of structural richness, which is very common across many different uh, domains, uh, which is the role of context, something that we have actually heard a lot about already during this conference, so I don't need to introduce the general idea to you, but just to kind of uh, place it in, a, uh, in the context of how theories of learning uh, usually think about uh, you know, f formalize the process of learning. Some of the most standard and, for very good reasons, most popular uh, models of learning really uh, have a mathematical form, uh, such as the Raskola Wagner rule or any other instantiation of, of what is sometimes known as the delta rule, is that there is an actual weight, some sort of a memory trace that is being updated over time, and it is this weight that is directly being uh, expressed in behavior. And we might have some other constants, such as learning rates. And, and uh, the important um, component here is that these weights are being updated continually over time as a function of the observations that the animal makes. Um, and also um, as a function of its own prediction, so that prediction errors would be, in this case, prediction errors would be driving uh, 
this learning. The details, the mathematical details of these rules are not really important. Um, there are many other instantiations in motor control, the common filter, but also in, uh, in animal learning later on, the common filter um, uh, has been uh, suggested as, uh, which can be seen as a kind of an interesting variation uh, on, uh, uh, but which nevertheless shares the same underlying idea that you are continually updating these weights uh, that directly uh, represent the, the strength of the memory. And here, for example, you would introduce an additional parameter, which is sometimes called the retention rate, and then the even newer versions, such as the dual rate model, which has been incredibly influential in the field of motor control in particular. Um, uh, and I think, actually, Stephen, uh, um, you know, the, the, the model that he talked about has a lot, of, a lot in common with, with this particular model. Um, you know, this can again be seen as yet another variation on the same theme, where now you have two of these processes, a slow and a fast process with different retention and, and, and learning rates. Um, what is common in all these models is that there is an underlying implicit, sometimes explicit assumption that performance is nothing else than a sum of memory traces. Or at, at any point in time, your performance is just summing all the memories that, uh, the effects of all the memories that you have stored, that therefore the learning curve is nothing else than the reflection of the, of the updating of these memory traces. And at any moment in time, computationally, the problem of how to update your memories is kind of trivial. Um, it's clear and obvious which traces need to be expressed and updated. Uh, either all of them uh, need to be updated or uh, whichever needs to be updated is un unambiguously indexed by, uh, by stimuli, such as in the rescola wagner rule. Um, so, this, this is the starting point for us, and what we were essentially trying to see is how well these ideas generalize uh, to a slightly more complex scenario, when you might actually have uncertainty about how different memories might be relevant at any moment in time. And so really these ideas, although the actual study we did was in the context of motor control, uh, but really these ideas are quite general, um, and recently we published a review paper where we tried to kind of unify um, kind of ideas and, and the very termolo terminology that different fields use to describe different effects, uh, different but analogous effects, um, using the, you know, an underlying, the same shared underlying theoretical framework. So in, cl in uh, field conditioning, for example, um, you would have uh, an animal, I mean, we have already heard several examples of field conditioning in this conf conference, so I'm not going to give you the details of that, uh, but the idea is that there is some common uh, elements that are important in all these um, paradigms. You have a sensory cue, such as the appearance of the, uh, of the Skinner box. Uh, you have a state, for example, whether the, the, the tone is played or not. Uh, you have an action. Uh, in classical conditioning uh, paradigms, you don't usually uh, uh, think about the action the animal takes, uh, or at least it's not relevant to what's going to happen to it. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's always taking some actions. There's some feedback, which of course is, is very relevant in a field conditioning paradigm. It's the presence or absence of a shock. Um, and then, importantly, there are contingencies. And that, those are, the contingencies are what the experimenter sets up in term, determining the statistics of sensory cues, states, feedback, and, act, uh, and, and actions. Uh, some of these statistics are directly controlled by the experimenter. Some of these uh, will also depend, obviously, on the, uh, on the subject. Uh, but the important thing is that different contexts are uh, characterized by different contingencies. And so, in a contextual field conditioning experiment, uh, you have, for example, two different contexts. We have seen uh, just before uh, ex uh, experiments with many more than, than two contexts, but the simplest variant would have two contexts, context one, context two. In one of them, the tone leads to shock. In the other one, it, it doesn't lead to shock. And so these are the common elements that then generalize across many different uh, domains of, of cognition and context-dependent learning, which I'm not going to describe right now. Uh, but instead, what I will focus on for now is, is the domain of motor control, where um, the, the action that participants are going to take are going to be actual movements of the arm. Uh, the feedback is going to be their motor errors uh, when uh, they are interacting with a particular uh, force field, as you'll see. Um, we will actually not be making use of the notion of a state uh, in these experiments, but we will heavily be uh, relying on different no uh, a notion of context, as, as you will see. And indeed, we will be using uh, a particular kind of sensory cue um, to uh, kind of indicate which context is currently active. All right, so 
What is common in all these paradigms is that in the, these are all lab-based paradigms, and in these lab-based paradigms, the, the identity of which context is currently on, is active, is relatively unambiguous. But we would like to argue that that is kind of definitely not the case in general in the wild. So for example, um, you know, in general, context estimation is going to be hard and uncertain. Um, and the simple reason for that is that we have multiple memories that we have stored for multiple contexts. And so, for example, when you're interacting with a, with a new kind of fruit or vegetable, I'm not even sure what, what it is, a persimmon, uh, you might already have modern memories uh, as to how to cut an orange, a tomato, or an apple. But the question is, which one are you going to express when you're interacting with this new kind of, uh, of food there? Um, and so, and that is, that, is, that is an interesting computational challenge once we have multiple memories corresponding to each of these, uh, each of these vegetables. Uh, similarly, uh, when a mouse meets a, f uh, a ferret in the forest, um, now when it, it, this is a new encounter, it needs to lay down a memory. The question is, how does it uh, store this memory? Does it uh, update its memory of the forest in general, the particular clearing, the, the chirping of the birds? So just as there are computational challenges as to deciding which memory to express at any one mo moment, there are also challenges associated with which memories to update uh, in general. Uh, and then also there are challenges as to uh, when to create entirely new memories. So the model that we have developed with James and Daniel uh, tries to uh, come up with a unified and principled approach to address all of these computational challenges. But today I'm really, given the title of the, the session, uh, Memory of Dating, I will really be focusing on this particular aspect here. And if you're still here next week, uh, the very last day Daniel is going to, is probably going to talk about uh, the other aspects of this work as well. Okay, so how do we formalize this general computational challenge of uh, you know, not being sure about what context is active and, and how to process memories based, uh, you know, given that sort of contextual inference. And so if you're unsure about what context is, uh, is relevant at any one time, uh, the, uh, the mathematically coherent way of expressing your beliefs about different co uh, contexts being uh, potentially uh, uh, relevant is the language of probability theory. So you need to make inferences about uh, about what context might be active. Uh, and in order to make inferences, you need to start with, a mo with an internal model of how you think the world generated uh, your uh, observations based on those contexts. So what I'm going to do now first is to describe not a model of learning, but an internal model that we assume subjects have when they interact with a richly structured world that has multiple contexts in it. And then the actual learning algorithm flows out of this model automatically, almost without any free knobs to turn, as a Bayesian inversion of the generative model, okay? So that's kind of the, the beauty and also the curse of the Bayesian approach is that um, you don't directly specify the learning algorithm. You specify what is, what is it that the learning algorithm is trying to learn about, and then the learning algorithm follows from that kind of automatically. Okay, so the assumption here is that context change over time. Um, and we take the simplest form of that change as a simple uh, first-order Markov, Markov process. So at, you know, at time t, the blue context is active, then uh, at time t plus one, it's, it switches to the red, then it stays red, and then it goes to orange. And for simplicity, we, uh, we consider uh, context to be discrete. Um, we can uh, consider other extensions, but for now, they are just going to be discrete um, kind of nominal uh, uh, variables. All right, each context may give rise to a, dis a different distribution of sensory cues, um, such as the appearance of the, uh, of the conditioning box in, 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 in conditioning, or as you'll see, uh, something about the, the virtual tool that our subjects manipulate uh, in, the, uh, in, in the model learning experiments that I'm going to tell you about. Importantly, uh, each context is associated with it with its own set of contingencies. So con the blue context is associated with uh, these contingencies that we denote by x1. The red context is associated with these contingencies denoted by x2 and so forth. Also importantly, each of these contingencies might change over time, uh, either slowly or fast. Each context might have its own dynamics by which its contingencies might be changing. Critically, 
in each time step. Their time here, again, for simplicity, is discretized. You can think about it as trials or time steps. For it, it's going to be trials. Um, the feedback that one gets depends on the current contingent of the contingency of the currently active context. So even though each context has its corresponding contingency, ex contingencies existing at all times, uh, even though I'm only plotting the red contingency from this time step, it also exists here. It's just for clarity I omitted. We omitted it here, and the same for the orange context. These contingencies exist at all times. The Skinner box is there somewhere, and it's associated with a particular set of rules as to whether a shock will be delivered or, uh, on a tone or not, independent of where you are. So those contingencies are present at all times. It's just that your current feedback is always based on the context that is currently active, the context in which you are in at the moment. OK? Can you please elaborate what is contingency? Yeah, so contingency, as I said earlier, is essentially a, a pairing, potentially probabilistic pairing, between states, actions, and feedback. Such as, for example, does the to is the tone followed by a foot shock or not? That's a contingency. Or in our case, uh, in the model learning experiments, the contingency will be a particular force field that the uh, participants will need to interact with. That's a contingency because it, it maps how your actions lead to a particular pattern of motor errors, for example, or a trajectory, motor kinematics. Yep. So context one is not active, it's the contingencies of that context that exist and are supposed to evolve. So think of context as, as different rooms in a building, right? I can go to context one, I'm, I'm going to be exposed to the contingencies in that room, I can leave that room, I can go to another room, that's context two, and I can interact with its contingencies, but room one still exists. And stuff might be still happening in, in room one, it might be changing as well while I'm not there. So that's, that's the metaphor. Uh, that might help to explain how we think about context and contingencies. And then I can go back to the blue room and I will suddenly be exposed to the contingencies that have always been there. And that's going to be critical because that means that once I infer that I'm black to the blue room, I should be able to pull out my memory of what's been going on in the blue room before. Christine, you had a question? I mean, it's, it's a particular notation that we use in, in graphical models, and in that notation, this is the right way to express this, this dependency. But all the, the, the point here is that the context determines which contingency gets to be expressed in, in the feedback. That's all what it means. And uh, yeah, it's just that in graphical models, this is the right way to express it. But I appreciate that this might not be the most intuitive way of doing it. It's just a formally correct way, if you, if you, want, if you like. Yeah, Peter. You only published this paper two for <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I tried to explain at the beginning. This is how the, the subject thinks about how the world might work, how the world might generate its observations, sensory cues, and feedback. No, it's, the, it's, it's only the current state of the currently active context that affects its feedback. That's, that should be, right? These are the different time steps. In time step T plus two, it's the, it's the contingency of, context, of the rat context at time T plus two that, that, that affects its feedback. It's going on, but that, that arrow is gray, which means, and that's actually uh, unusual notation to, act, to make it slightly more intuitive at least, is that actually what this context does is that it gates the influences of these contingencies. So really in this context, in, in this time step, it's only xt plus 2 that affects yt plus 2. There is an arrow, again, for formal reasons, the arrow needs to be there. Uh, but we, we at least grade it to make it slightly closer to not being there. <laughs> There's a clash between kind of general intuition and how these models are supposed, how these graphical models are supposed to be drawn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Miguel. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, so that's exactly what's happening here. So if you think that the contingency was there in the blue context, once you believe that you have returned to the blue context, you, you must think that the contingency of that particular context is still, is still there. It might have changed depending on how you think the dynamics of that, uh, of that context. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, as the questions already show, this is a rather complicated model. Um, <laughs> And so, and yet, believe me, this is still very much simplified in, in many, many ways compared to, you know, reality, but at least it's, it's a beginning. And so, I'm, I'm emphasizing that it's a complicated model to really emphasize the fact that it's a real computational challenge what then the, the participant needs to do, and now we're going back to Peter's earlier point, that so far, this is just what the, the participant, our participants assume about how the world works. But the real challenge is that they only get to observe the sensory cues and the feedback. They do not directly observe the context or any of the contingencies. So their job is to take this sequence of sensory cue and feedback observations and infer based on those at any moment in time, what is the currently active context and what are the contingencies of each of uh, already encountered contexts. And that's a very challenging inference uh, kind of computation to perform. And I'm going to immediately preempt uh, a lot of questions about, okay, but how does this happen neurally? Uh, the answer number one is that we really don't know, but we would like to know a lot. Uh, answer number two, wait until the summary slide. Uh, and then I'll, I'll give you one, uh, uh, one reference where, where we started at least speculating about it uh, by trying to kind of come together uh, data that is already there in the literature and try to relate it to uh, these kind of uh, computations. All right, so we, we can at least, um, you know, implement this inference uh, in a computer and importantly, the model that we develop is essentially going to invert this uh, internal model and infer all these hidden variables, contexts and contingencies, as well as a number, uh, uh, a bunch of parameters such as it will infer, we will not give it a particular number of contexts. It will infer how many contexts there are, kind of automatically, in a data-driven way. It will also infer the, or estimate the context transition probabilities, so the probabilities with, with which different contexts transition uh, between them, as well as the Q-emission probabilities. It will also estimate uh, the dynamics with which contingencies change in each context. Uh, and it, uh, of course, it will also infer the currently active context at any moment in time, as well as the contingencies for each context. There was a question in the back? No, the context, that's the sensory cue. The sensory cue is the appearance of the Skinner box. The context causes that appearance, but it also causes, importantly, uh, uh, you know, it also gates which contingency get, gets to determine the feedback. Context is that you are in the field conditioning context. That's not something directly observable to the animal. What it observes is the appearance of the Skinner box and whether it gets a foot shock following a tone or not. So those are the two obs uh, observations that it makes. But this, the, the concept of a context is actually abstract. It's, it's, you know, we, it's in, a, in the eye of the beholder, if you like. Uh, Peter? Um, so we don't model actions directly uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. They are kind of implicit in there, uh, in that the feedback also depended on your action, uh, but, they, but the action is always observable uh, in this framework, so we, we don't model it directly. Mm -hmm. No, so here the, the, they could, but for simplicity we assume that the sensory cues are actually, the, the, the distribution of sensory cues is static within each context. It, we could extend it such that it's also essentially part of the contingency and therefore is also allowed to change. Yeah. Okay. So how do we do, how, how do we perform this inference? And if, what, and again, what I would like to emphasize is that now I'm going to kind of describe it as an algorithm, but really this algorithm is not a specific choice. Once you say that, okay, I want to infer these variables up there based on these variables down here, you don't have freedom to choose what exactly you're doing here. That's essentially you, you, you are bound to follow the rules of probability. Of course, the actual implementation uh, will, will include a lot of choices, uh, but none of the things that we have tested so far empirically depend on those, specific, on those very specific algorithmic choices. Okay, so 
the way to understand how now learning happens in this model is that, you know, to break it up to uh, different time steps. So in, in each time step, you already have uh, carryover from the past previous context estimates in, in the form of a distribution, uh, probability distribution over context that essentially tells you how probable you think you, that you are currently in context one or context two or uh, an unseen, a yet unseen context. And then you update that distribution based on the sensory cue that you get in that time step. So this is before movement. You already have some estimated uh, uh, probabilities uh, uh, for, for, for the context that you are already familiar with here, one and two, and also kind of a generic unknown context. Now, for each context, you also have associated already um, contingencies, and ideally, you, you also represent a distribution over the con of those contingencies. And again, how this could happen neurally, I think that's a very interesting question. Peter Latham has uh, published uh, uh, about um, you know some interesting ideas relating to that, but I'm not going to say anything much here. Um, importantly, now when you need to express a memory, so to to make a movement or to to, to choose an action. You need to, the ideal way of combining information across all these memories that are associated with your different uh, contexts. So the, your memories in this framework are nothing else than your estimates of the contingencies for each of the contexts uh, that you're currently representing. You need to express these different contexts in a way that is commensurate with the probabilities with which you think they are active. So you should be relying on your red memory more than on your blue memory and the exact ways in which those should be mixed depends uh, on some of the details. Again, for the experiments we did, uh, the simplest thing was sufficient, which is that you essentially mix, linearly mix these distributions uh, with these probabilities as the mixing weights and you just take the mean of that uh, general average distribution. That simple averaging is not always the optimal way to go about it. Uh, but uh, but in, in in these particular experiments, this this uh, we thought was was close enough. Okay, so then the model command that you choose is again the mean of this average distribution that is an average of the red and the blue weighted by these probabilities and also the novel. Um, and and now you get feedback based on your model command. And once you got feedback, you can now update your context probabilities because the feedback gives you more information about which context you might actually be in. Uh, and so for in, in this example, which is obviously just a cartoon, suddenly you think that, oh, maybe this is a novel context. And then something interesting happens. Uh, if, if the probability of a novel context uh, is increased, you should, uh, you know, with, with that exact probability, you should also consider that maybe you are now, that, that you should inst instantiate a new context, context three. So that's memory creation. Um, and once you instantiated a new context, uh, you should uh, you should also um, uh, you know, estimate it, start estimating the contingencies that go with that context. But yeah. It's your your favorite description of what the contingencies might be. Here I'm showing the simplest example in which it's just a scalar weight, but it could be it could be like itself a richly structured representation. So uh, it could be, you know, it could be a lookup table uh, of some sort, um, uh, which, states, uh, which states and actions lead to what rewards, or it, it might be something different here. I'm just uh, representing it with a single scalar weight. Uh, yeah, so the, there is a contingency, and in, in this case, and again, in the experiments we are going to uh, uh, look at, the contingency is, can actually be described by a single scalar variable, and I'll tell you what, what that is. It's essentially the, the direction of the force field that we expose our participants to. It's not a synaptic way. I mean, it could be, a synapt it could be implemented in a synaptic way, but uh, it, this is not what we mean here. The feedback is what? The feedback is determined by the environment. That's a way. That's a way. Uh, the, feed, the feedback um, is a piece of external information that you get from the environment, and then you take that into account in order to update your, your, uh, prob your estimated probabilities of the context, and in the next step, you're also using it to update your existing memories. Uh, 
It could be a single scalar variable, yes. Uh, it could be, again, something richer, but again, in our case, it's going to be a single scalar variable. No, so, so here the, the feedback could be, you know, somewhere here, for example, and then you would be updating your, the contingencies, and this is exactly the, the critical point that I'm getting at. You should use that feedback to update all your memories, not just one, but importantly, you shouldn't update all your memories in the same way. You should update your memories depending on the, the responsibilities, with, you know, the probabilities with which you think they, are, they have been responsible for, for generating that feedback. So the critical insight here is that these probabilities should also scale the degree to which you are updating your memories. And then you cycle over to the next time step. So again, lots of things going on here. And uh, the, the main insight is that contextual inference, your inferred probabilities over context, should control memory expression, memory creation, and memory updating. But today I'm only, going, I'm only talking about how they should affect memory updating. And the basic uh, principle is that if you think that a context is more probable, you should be updating it more. And if you think it's less probable, you should be updating it less. It's graded. In general, it should be graded. It should not be all or, all or none. And it should be multiplexed. You should be uh, uh, updating memory, memory, many memories at once. And so I think that's an interesting new way of thinking about memory updating, and I would like to get to presenting the, the experimental evidence because I have very little time left, so I'll, I'll take questions later. Okay, so um, one interesting uh, insight that comes out of this framework is that if you go back to the original example I showed you about the learning curve, this is a, this is a typical learning, I mean, this is a simulated learning curve, but uh, something that would be very close to uh, what you could measure in a, in a standard model learning experiment. Here's the perturbation that you expose your subjects to, and here is how you measure their adaptation is going on over a course of uh, a number of trials. But what this model tells us is that the same learning curve uh, might be hiding very different underlying processes. So the classical way of thinking about it, when you think that, when you don't think uh, that contexts are relevant at all, is that essentially you're always in the same context, in the blue context, that therefore has a probability of one at all times, and you see this learning curve arise because you have been updating the corresponding memory. But actually, this, this model tells you that uh, something completely different might be going on. You might have already inferred based on previous experience that there is two contexts associated with very different contingencies. And all what happens is that you gradually infer that context, that the red context is active rather than the blue context, but you're not updating any of the memories associated with, with those contexts. And of course, it might be some mixture of the two as well. So we call this proper learning because it's associated with the, the actual updating of a memory trace. And we call this apparent learning because there is no updating of any particular memory. It's just, it just appears to be learning because you see a learning curve like that. And that's a fundamental insight that comes out of this model, which we have also tested ex uh, uh, experimentally, which I'm also not going to tell you about, but uh, you, you'll hear from, uh, about that from Daniel later. Okay, so finally to the empirical uh, uh, part of the work, uh, which of course was all uh, by James and Daniel because uh, I'm just a theorist. So uh, the standard paradigm that they are working with is a, is a kind of a dynamic force field learning paradigm when, where participants are uh, uh, ma uh, manipulating a robotic manipulandum uh, that can both uh, record in fine detail their movements and the forces they exert on, on the handle of the manipulandum and also uh, expose them to different uh, artificially constructed force fields. And the task is very simple. They need to reach ahead to a target uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, 10 or, or so 10 centimeters ahead of them by, uh, by doing a quick uh, forward-reaching movement. And so, in the simplest case, there is no force field, so, you know, subjects can uh, very quickly, uh, uh, you know, adapt to, to doing that. But, of course, when it becomes interesting is that now when we start exposing them to a force field uh, through this uh, robotic manipulandum, and the force field might be a, uh, a counterclockwise force field, uh, which we, uh, we will call P plus, or a clockwise uh, force field, uh, uh, like a curl force field, which we'll call P minus. And of course, which one is P plus and P minus is, is balanced across subjects, usually. All right. Um, importantly, we also have channel trials where uh, whatever the subject does, they will actually reach straight to the target, uh, 
Um, so they've ha they will have no motor errors. They will have no observations of these motor errors. Uh, but we can record uh, the forces with which they bump into the, into the walls of that simulated channel, which we simulate using the same uh, equipment. Okay, so in these channel trials, we can we can measure the force, uh, therefore, uh, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the participant exerts, and we can compare that to the ideal force that would be ideal for counteracting the particular force field uh, to which they have been exposed. And so then, you know, th this is potentially very rich data, but we will compress it into a single scalar quantity of uh, measure of adaptation, which essentially just tells us, you know, how big is this bump relative to the ideal bump. Uh, so here it would be uh, 0.3. And then over a course of experiment, we can use several of uh, such channel trials to measure the degree of adaptation, and we can plot that as a function of time or trials in this case. All right. So using this general paradigm, we can now uh, start testing the general theory of uh, memory updating. Uh, and in particular, that it should be uh, depend, uh, depend, it should be controlled by uncertainty about context. And so this is a classical model of, of, uh, of memory updating uh, in so-called state space models uh, that has a, have a single context, but again, the dual rate model would uh, kind of conceptually be very similar. And the idea here is that you update uh, proportional to the motor error that you are making and some Kalman gain. Uh, what this model, adds to that it's, uh, is that there, there should be essentially a third term which uh, corresponds to the responsibility of the current context. So you should be updating depending on how responsible you think uh, the, uh, the, that particular context was for your observations. And you should be updating the memories for all your uh, contexts uh, in that way. So all memories should be updated proportional to their responsibilities. And so we are going to test this principle uh, by introducing our subjects to two contexts. The sensory cue is essentially which control point they need to get to a particular target, whether it's on the right of this virtual tool or to the left, but importantly, the actual movement they need to make is exactly the same in both cases. Uh, uh, it's just the, the uh, whether they think they are controlling this point to that target or, or that point to that target that, that defines uh, the context. And we also pair these sensory cues with two different force fields, just as I told you before, P plus and P minus. We uh, expose them uh, to these two contexts in random alteration. And then we can measure how well they adapt, and they adapt uh, uh, fairly well to both. So I'm, I'm here, we are here averaging uh, across how well they have adapted to, to both fields, and uh, they learn reasonably well. Uh, it's importantly here the time axis is blocks, and actually what I haven't told you yet is that at the beginning of each block, um, we, uh, we wash them out by using null fields, and the reason for that will become uh, clear in a moment. Uh, so actually, in each of these blocks, they have to relearn, and it's a kind of an interesting effect of saving that you can see here that uh, over time, they improve how well they can learn, even though the washout baseline uh, is, is, is roughly constant across these blocks. Yeah? The cues are unambiguous here. The cues are unambiguous, yeah. Uh, yeah, so here, just wait a moment. Uh, here, there, is no, there should be no difficulty for them in inferring the context. Of course, at the very beginning, they don't know what these cues mean. So at the very beginning, they might have uncertainty as to which context they are in, but after some while, they should learn that indeed, you know, this control point is always, uh, uh, unless they are in the washout phase, is always uh, associated with uh, P plus, and this control point is always associated with P minus. So it's totally deterministic so far. Okay. So now what we do uh, is that once we wash them out, we uh, use triplets of trials where the first and the last trial is a channel trial with the sensory cue relevant for context one. Okay. And in between them, we sandwich two kinds of trials, either a P plus one trial, so this kind of trial, or that kind of trial. And that allows us to see, because here and here we are in those in these channel trials, we are using the sensory cue associated with Q1 that allows us to uh, measure how much the memory for context one has been updated as a function of the experience that the subject got in this single trial. So we call that a measure of single trial learning, okay? And so when we do that, we can uh, see something uh, that already begins to, to look interesting. What you see here is that in the beginning, uh, they actually seem to be updating the, the memory of context one on both of these kinds of trials. 
which is consistent with this idea there, there is more uncertainty at the beginning of the experiment about what context is what. And then later on, uh, these curves really diverge and they, they seem to be only updating this memory on, on, on the blue trials and not on the red trials. And indeed, we can fit our model uh, quantitatively trial to trial uh, to this behavior and it provides uh, uh, quite a nice fit both, you know, to, to all the data that we have in, in, in all these channel trials across the experiment. Okay? Uh, we fit it subject by subject, uh, and we show everything uh, average across subjects here. Okay. But now comes the critical uh, manipulation, which is exactly what, what uh, I think you were anticipating, Christine, which is that now we are introducing two more kinds of uh, exposure trials here, where we deliberately induce what is known in, in perception as a Q conflict, because now there's going to be a conflict between the perturbation and the sensory Q. And the idea there is that in, in these trials, you know, in the P plus one trial and the P, mi one minus two, uh, P minus two trial, uh, the, the information provided by the Q, which is essentially the prior, and the information provided by the perturbation, which is essentially the likelihood, are going to be consistent in that the, uh, you know, on, on P plus one trials, both the prior uh, and the likelihood, at least by the end of learning, so this is beginning of learning, end of learning, uh, uh, say that, yeah, in these trials, it must have been the blue context. In these trials, it, it must have been the red context, and therefore the prior and the likelihood for the blue context is, is low there. But on these uh, Q conflict trials, there's conflicting information that is coming from the prior and the likelihood. And so we expect that, therefore, we should see a partial amount of memory updating. Yeah? It's a posterior. Uh, in fact, because it's all going on continually, every prior then becomes a posterior in the next time step. Uh, so it's a posterior computed given everything else before, as well as the Q and the perturbation that has already happened in this trial, that has been experienced in this trial. And so that's exactly what we see here. Before training, there's not, not much gradation, but at the end of training, we see a very nice gradation in, these, uh, in, in this measure of single trial learning. Okay, and the model reproduces that quite nicely. Uh, we can see that indeed if we separately check whether there is an effect of, of perturbation and Q, both are highly significant, and importantly, these effects do not separate across subjects. So it's not like some of the subjects only care about the Q and some others only care about the perturbation. It's really everybody cares about everything. What we do not know is whether in a single trial really both matter or on, uh, on a single trial it's only one or the other. That, that would require kind of uh, a slightly differently designed experiment and that's something that we are actually quite interested in. All right, uh, let me just go to the summary slide and then if there is any time for questions, I'll take them. I'll skip the second part of the talk. It was supposed to be like a plug-in for a perspective. Um, so I might come back with that during the perspective session. Um, and I'll just go to the summary uh, slide straight. Um, so the principle that I've been talking about is that uncertainty should be controlling memory updating as well as expression and creation. I didn't get to talk about that. You'll hear about that from Daniel later. Uh, contextual uncertainty specifically should drive the processing of context-specific memories, their updating, expression, and, and creation. Uh, we had some new experimental predictions in model learning that we tested experimentally. Uh, we think that these uh, principles actually uh, generalize across many different uh, domains of cognition and, and context-dependent learning. And we have started working out, uh, you know, uh, how this framework might be relevant for these uh, different, at least for, for a couple of these different domains here. Uh, it suggests this fundamental distinction between apparent uh, and, and proper learning. It also suggests uh, uh, a distinction between within uh, of, uh, and between context volatility. So um, a lot of people are interested in how environmental volatility affects learning rates. And what this model suggests is that actually it, uh, the way it should affect learning rates should depend on whether it's a volatility of context changing or whether it's the volatility of, a, of the contingency of a single context uh, that is changing over time. And it should have different effects or, or that, that should be uh, observable in behavior. Uh, more on all of that from Daniel uh, next week. Uh, we are very much interested in mapping uh, these computational uh, elements uh, onto cognitive processes uh, and in particular to neural substrates. We have started uh, thinking about those as well, uh, but I think it's very much an open question. Uh, and in particular, one thing that I would just like to put out there is, is, uh, is uh, what might be the neural mechanisms that might actually allow this uncertainty-gated or uncertainty-modulated updating of memories.
I would be really keen to hear ideas about that because we didn't come up with too many, to be honest, uh, when we were writing this review here. Um, okay, so uh, I didn't get to talk about that part, uh, so I would just like to thank my collaborators, James and Daniel, also Jean-Pascal and Peter for the other project that uh, I might talk about in the perspective session, and my funders and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mate. Um, so unfortunately, with this session, uh, we're out of time for questions, but we can take more questions from Mate in the discussion uh, and perspective section. So now we just switch context to the break. Uh, we'll come back <laughs> at 11. And again, uh, if you do want to add something to the perspective slides, this is a good chance to do it. <laughs>